Welcome to Lessons for Living Television. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. When you think of a campfire, I mean, what do you think of? You know one of the first things that comes to mind for me? Marshmallows. Now, do you know how old marshmallows are? 50 years old? 100 years old? 200 years old? Now, would you believe that the marshmallow was around before Columbus discovered America. There is a possibility that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph might have actually eaten marshmallows while they were in exile in Egypt. You see, historians estimate that the marshmallow came into being some 4,000 years ago. According to the Boyer Candy Company, marshmallows come from the sweet sap of the mallow plant that grows in salty marshes near large bodies of water and can grow to two to four feet high. Hence, marsh plus mallow, the marshmallow. The ancient Egyptian would use the mallow root for making these candy delicacies for their gods nobility and pharaohs for 2,000 years have eaten these. It, in fact, it was a crime for anyone else to eat this treat. The children, well, they look to honey and figs to cure their sweet tooth. Egyptian marshmallows, they were a mixture of mallow sap, honey, grains, and then where they would be baked into cakes. The Romans and the Greeks, they loved the mallow plant. And they believed that brewed mixtures of the mallow sap, it would help cure sore throats and, and other aches and pains. That sugar mixture was found among some of the tre medical treatments that, that Hippocrates had. During the 15th and 16th centuries, Marshmallow liquids were given as treatments for toothaches, for, for coughs, for sore throats, for indigestion, even diarrhea. It was even believed to have been a love potion used at one time or another. But it was the French during the 1800s that changed the use of the mallow plant from mainly medicinal purposes to a more sort of candy purposes that would be consumed now by adults. French shop owners discovered that cooking and whipping marshmallow sap with egg whites and corn syrup well, created this easily moldable substance. And that's where the marshmallow, as we know it today, was born. In the 1900s, marshmallow was being sold as penny candies in tiny tins. And it was at this time that the Boyer brothers interested in growing their neighborhood business started experimenting with marshmallow cream and tried to cover it with chocolate. After many unsuccessful attempts, their mother, Emily, suggested, well, why not put it in a paper cup? Using the only thing that they had available, a paper cup, it became sort of a cake holder. And they tried again and again, and once more, and finally success. And what is called today the mallow cup was born. Now, why all this discussion about marshmallows? Well, we're going to, in our study of Daniel today, we're going to see that there is a fiery furnace. Let's get back to our study. Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. That'll give us the context for our study today. Here is what it says. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and it's with six cubits, and he set it upon the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, 
the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at the time when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. The administrative leaders came and were attending this great event. They came from all parts of this growing empire. The occasion was a dedication ceremony. Although not primarily a religious gathering, religion played an important role in almost everything the Babylonians did. No priests or philosophers or astrologers were mentioned as being present, but governors, captains, judges, counselors, and, and rulers of the provinces, well, they were all required to attend. The pageant was designed to impress everyone with the glory of Babylon. You see, at the time of the dream of Daniel 2, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been appointed as administrative leaders, at least according to Daniel Chapter 2, verse 49. And so, as administrative leaders, they would be present at the ceremony. There was no mistaking the royal order. I mean, refusal to obey the king's order, well, that was treason. The situation was important. The atmosphere was tense. To understand the real issues involved, we must see this as one of the unusual ways God chose to reveal truth to Babylon. The Hebrews, well, they could not in good conscience worship the image. The king was embarrassed. The king was outraged. He orders the three men to appear before him, Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready... At the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Nebuchadnezzar, they had never given him any reason to doubt their loyalty. Now, he knew, of course, that they did not worship his gods. But from his point of view, I mean, he wasn't asking them to abandon the worship of their God. All they had to do in his head was to bow down in recognition of the fact, well, that Babylon was the greatest power on earth. To disobey the king's order, well, that's treason. 
and treason is punishable by death. But Nebuchadnezzar, he seems eager to spare their lives. He gives them another chance. Well, they didn't need another chance. To them, the issue is perfectly plain. So with courtesy, they replied, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. <laughs> wow, put yourself in Nebuchadnezzar's shoes just for a moment. I mean, you can appreciate his problem. I mean, I, I can see it from his perspective. If he's about to let these men defy him, well, that would have seriously affected his standing as a ruler. I mean, his position before the world hits at stake. And so their refusal, it's got to be punished. And so he commands that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. He gets the strongest men of the army, and they were the ones that were selected for this execution. He, they come and they pick up these men and they were tossed, the Bible says, into that blazing fire. Nebuchadnezzar had no idea of the power he was opposing. Boy, but he was about to get a revelation of his life. He saw the God whom he had defied walking in the fire with his three faithful servants. That was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Not only did the king see the miracle, but so did all of the leaders and the governors and the treasurers that were there. Look at verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on their bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. The fire that had killed the executioners had no power over the men. They thought to destroy them, but not a hair on their head was singed. Moving nearer the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar called to them, the term servants of the Most High God was a reverent name, evidently well known by the king. That term, Most High, well, that's found some eight times in the first five chapters of Daniel. So overwhelmed was Nebuchadnezzar by his revelation of divine power that he decided to go into partnership with this God. He even made a decree granting recognition to the Hebrew religion. He pledged protection for the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as if God even needed any human protection. 
Nebuchadnezzar declared that if anyone anywhere ever says anything against God, they will be punished severely because there has never been another God who could pull off a rescue like that one. So what does this story tell us? Well, I think it has a huge message. I'm reminded of the words of Joshua there. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. It says, Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You see, those young men, they knew God would deliver them. But they did say in verse 18, but if not, how hard are those words to say? You see, God does not always intervene, intervene in such a miraculous way. We can imagine the emotions of these men watching as this furnace is, is heated up seven times hotter. When they had arrived in Babylon, they changed their names, but their devotion to the living God would not be changed. They were members of a conquered race. And when they appeared before Nebuchadnezzar, they're standing there before the conqueror, yet they were unconquerable. Their names are repeated 13 times in this chapter. Everyone present knew exactly who these men were. And before that day ended, the whole slew of Babylonian leaders knew that in these three Hebrews, there was no compromise. You see, no matter what you and I face in life, no matter how hot the furnace or what kind of fire we find ourselves in, we are not alone. God is with us. You see, the issue isn't whether we're going to be spared the flames and fire of life or whether God will keep us from suffering, that's not really suggested here at all. Jesus even said that we can expect to feel the heat. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but have faith, for I have overcome the world. You see, the biblical faith is this. God never promises to keep us out of the flames and the fire of life. But God promises to be right there with us, smack dab in the middle of the flames and in the fire. You know, I'm sorry to tell you this, but there is no such thing as a fireproof life or even fireproof faith. Accepting Christ doesn't give us some kind of heavenly fire insurance insurance but it does give us a promise from God a promise of the very presence of God through Jesus Christ in whatever situation we find ourselves and that's what fueled the faith of Shadrach Meshach and Abednego see to them it didn't really matter whether God saved them or not. They knew they already belonged to God. They already knew what, what Paul would write to future churches, that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And so these young men, filled with that kind of faith, knew that nothing would get in their way. No decree no 90-foot golden idol, no king, not even the threat of death in a fiery furnace. They were faithful because God is faithful. The Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, was the unexpected guest there in the furnace. The Son of God was there, the fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They didn't bow. They didn't bend. But they also didn't burn. You see, the fires of life, they're going to happen. So why not let the Son of God 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be the fourth man in the midst of your fires of life. When you get thrown from the frying pan into the fire, when your life feels like it's caught in the crossfire and you're facing another baptism by fire, remember, you're not alone. Jesus walks with us. Don't forget the marshmallows. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your constant companionship. Father, we know that nothing can separate us from your love, and I pray right now for those that are in the fiery furnace of life right now, going through a situation that to them seems unsolvable. Father, may they look and see that you walk in their midst. Comfort them, strengthen them, encourage them. Always be with them. Bless each and every viewer, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of another Lessons for Living television program. Uh, right off the bat, let me thank you uh, for joining us uh, each and every week and for letting your friends know to tune in also. Before we go, a few things I want to talk to you about, I want to remind you of. I want to remind you of our website, uh, l4ltv.com. Uh, the website, uh, lots of stuff on there that can be of help to you. Uh, the gift, you can request it from the website if you like. On the website, you will you have a tab there for all of our previous programs. So if you've missed any of the programs or if you want to refer a friend to see the programs, well then, um, go on the website, l4ltv.com. If you click on the previous programs tab, they're all, they're all available there. Back from when we first started broadcasting. Every single one of them is there. You can share them. You can rewatch them. You can do all kinds of stuff with them. Also on that page, on the website, there is the um, Live Appearances tab. And when you click on that tab, you're going to find out where I will be appearing live. If you ever want to come out and, and, um, and see me live, the, the dates are there and the location. There's Google Maps. will tell you exactly where I'm going to be. And there's also a tab that says Donate Today. And if you click on that tab, you can make a donation to the ministry. You can do that by credit card or by Interact Debit. Just on that point alone of the, of the donations, every donation that comes into this ministry is applied directly to the ministry. Not a penny of it goes to cover my salary or any of my expenses. Every penny that's donated goes to paying for airtime, paying for the studio time, paying for the gifts we give out. And so... Um, you can know that every penny is utilized directly in the proclamation of this good news because that's exactly what Jesus has asked us to do. He said the message is to be preached to the entire world and then the end will come. And so we're trying to do our part to get that message out. On social media, uh, Facebook, we have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash L4L television. Go on the Facebook page, like us. And this way, um, you can stay up to speed on everything that we're doing. We post it on Facebook. Shortly after this program goes off the air, it'll be up on the Facebook page. And from there, you can also share it uh, with your friends. You can follow me on Instagram at Santos underscore Bill. Every day, I post a little clip, you know, less than a minute long, with just a particular thought for the day. You can get that on the Instagram page, Santos underscore Bill. And then you can also repost it and share it with your friends. You can follow me on Twitter, Santos underscore Bill. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. When you subscribe to the YouTube channel, every time uh, a new video is added to our YouTube channel, you're going to get a notification. And this way you'll stay up to speed on any new developments uh, in the ministry. Now. There's another component of our ministry, which is the work that we do overseas, the humanitarian work. And that part of our ministry we call Mission Now Canada. We've dedicated a website just to that work. It is missionnowcanada.com. 
When you go on that website, you're going to see some of the work that we've done overseas in places like the Philippines and South America and where the next trip is going to be. And there's a countdown there uh, as to how many weeks till that next uh, mission trip. And so when you're on the Mission Now Canada website, you can sign up for the newsletter. And this way, you're going to be in the loop as we move towards arranging the next mission trip. You're going to be informed and you'll know where that is. And, and maybe you're going to want to join us on one of those trips. They can be life-changing experiences. Check out all the pictures and all the work that, that's been done there. There's also a donate tab on the Mission Now Canada website if you want to support that humanitarian uh, part of our ministry where we're serving needy populations around the world. Well, not a lot of time left. They're giving me the sign that I have to finish. Thank you again for joining us. Um, I hope we have the chance to do this again next time. It, I'll tell you, it wouldn't be the same if you're not here. So I look forward to being with you again next time. In the meantime, I'll be praying that God blesses you. We'll see you again real soon.